Greetings, I'm Ben. And welcome to another R video. In this video, uh, this is the third part of a three-part series about model fit. The first part uh, identified a problem with um, model fit in CFA, where when you have variables like this trait reactance variable, where it should be pretty well behaved, but there are a handful of items. In this case, there are 14 items. Um, and then you have, you know, a handful of variables. You can end up with poor model fit, um, even if your variables are, are pretty good. In the second um, video, we looked at the residual matrix using this um, resid line to try to find uh, diagnostic information about why we might not have good model fit. And we actually concluded that this attitude four item was problematic. And if you watch the first video, you saw that, um, that in that video, we identified this as a potentially problematic item because it was about efficacy is being a living organ donor difficult or easy. And the rest of the items were about normative evaluations. Is it a good idea or a bad idea to be a living organ donor? And so we decided that it was theoretically justified to remove it and that we probably shouldn't have had an item like that in the scale in the in the first place. So in this video, we're going to um, further diagnose issues with our um, model fit. So looking at the Initial model fit, the RMSEA was 0 0.087, the SRMR was 106, the CFI was 0 0.84, and the TLI was 0 0.83. And that attitude four item only loaded 0 0.295. So if we get rid of that item, um, the TLI and CFI are still 0.865 for the CFI, 0.851 for the TLI, 0.08 for the RMSEA, and 0.08 for the SRMR. So still not great model fit. Um, and we found some clues about why that might be happening in the um, residual matrix, but now we're going to look at the modification indices. And um, one thing that you need, you might need to do, let's see. So we uh, got all of our modification indices. Um, you, if, you re if you receive a message, an error message at the bottom or a message that says you reached your maximum um, lines, that it's not going to print more lines, then you need to change how many lines it gives you with an um, options increase max print. Let's see if I have something around here that does that. I think you just need, it's just like, well, you'll have to figure out how to increase the, the max print on your options to get all of the modification indices. But now if we scroll to the top, so you can see there are a lot of modification indices. And the MI column is the one that we're really interested in. And the first thing we're going to get are uh, cross loadings. So RS is the trait reactance, and then we're getting cross loadings for freedom threat. And the first thing that we see right off the bat is a pretty high modification index for freedom threat one on trait reactance. Now, what does that mean? It means that this item, this freedom threat one item, has more in common with the trait reactance variable than we're estimating with just the correlation between freedom threat and trait reactance. And the model wants us to free a cross loading. So it wants us to let this item in the freedom threat measure load on both the freedom threat variable and the trait reactance variable. Now, I don't love that because that item is just supposed to measure how much people felt like the message they read was threatening their freedom to choose. It's not trying to measure in general, how much they don't like um, to be told what to do. So I don't think that's theoretically justified. Um, and furthermore, you know, this is, trait reactance is supposed to be a moderator and freedom threat is supposed to be a mediator. And so I don't want to take an item from the mediator and allow it to also load on the moderator. That, that feels um, not very tenable to me. So I understand why that's a high modification index, but I also don't think I should modify the mo modify the model to allow that cross-loading. That seems like an inappropriate modification to the model. 
Now, you might be saying, okay, 52 is high. What about 3? What about 6? What about 16? What's a high number here? Well, first of all, the modification indices are estimating how much the chi-square statistic at quantifying our misfit is likely to go down if we make this modification. And the chi-square statistic is sensitive to how many people are in the sample. Um, and so the, what's a big modification index kind of depends on a handful of things related to your study. So what you're really looking for here are numbers that are big relative to the other numbers. So 52 is much bigger than anything on the screen so far. 16 is larger than the other numbers in this column so far, but it's not anywhere near 52. And if we kind of scroll down, you know, we have an 11, we have a 12. Um, here we have a 42, and this is freedom threat on anger. And so again, it's that freedom threat one item. So it suggests that that item has more information related to our variables than is being captured by the other freedom threat items. And it does kind of make you want to go back and look at the wording of that item and say, you know, why aren't we fully capturing everything in that item with this latent variable? Um, and, you know, anger is supposed to be a part of psychological reactants. When people feel like their freedom is being threatened, it's supposed to make them angry. So it makes sense that this item would have more in common with this variable. But all of that should be captured by the correlation between anger and the latent freedom threat variable. And so we shouldn't need an, a modification to account for this. It might suggest that that one item is a really direct measure of freedom threat and the other items are maybe a little more indirect. And so maybe this one is just doing a little bit better job and has a little bit more information about why people are angry. But um, I don't know, it could be nothing. It could just be uh, something funny with the sample. And it certainly isn't something that I would say, ah, oh, this is a good reason to make that modification. I would say, no, we're already estimating the relationship between anger and freedom threat with the latent correlation between those two items. Or maybe it's a regression coefficient where freedom threat is, is predicting anger. And so I don't think we need to free this cross-loading. But I am interested in why this item is behaving differently relative to anger and trait reactants compared to the other freedom threat items. Now, this is the last cross-loading. And I do look at cross-loadings with a lot of suspicion because if I free this cross-loading up here, I'm saying, oh, this, this question about whether you felt like your freedom is threatened is actually also measuring anger. And so I can measure two variables with this one item. Um, and I'm allowing it to contribute information to both. And so, you know, that, you know, it's kind of, we're saying, oh, it's double-barreled. Um, and I don't love doing that. I mean, I, I would rather not do that. I would rather not specify uh, cross-loading um, if at all possible. And, um, and so, so I'm much more interested here in the correlated residuals. Do the individual items have extra information in common with each other that's not being captured by the, um, you know, by the latent relationship? And, you know, RS1, RS2, these are two trait reactants items. Eight, yeah, that's not very interesting. Six, not very interesting. We scroll down, we see an 11 for RS5 and RS2, an 11 for RS12 and RS2. That's not, you know, nothing's really jumping out here. RS3 and RS6 is a 31. RS3 and RS7 is a 21. RS3 and RS8 is a 22. That's interesting a lot with RS3 popping right here. It makes me wonder if the wording of these items has some redundancy in them. And, and maybe that's why we're getting those um, correlated residuals. Another one with RS3 and RS11, RS3 and RS14, and then RS3 and FT1. So this is that freedom threat variable in that RS3. So, and then here's another one with RS3 where we get 24. So we're getting a lot of correlated residuals with RS3. It kind of makes me want to go back to that trait reactant scale and say, what's going on with RS3? But again, it could just be, you know, sampling error. Um, 
and reading the scale, it seemed like a perfectly reasonable item. You know, you'd be tempted to say, well, if I just delete RS3, all of these correlated residuals are going to go away. Uh, maybe I just delete FT1 so those cross loadings go away, and I delete RS3 so these correlated residuals go away, and maybe my model fit will be good enough. But we think these are both good items. We believe in them as good measures in our scales. And so don't wanna, we don't want to just delete them so that we can chase model fit. Now we have a 45 for RS4 and RS6. That's interesting. Maybe that's something worth specifying. Let's see. So I see a 15. I see a 16. Oh, here we, we got a 59 between RS6 and RS10. And here, RS6, we identified RS6 in the um, residual matrix as having a lot of uh, noise going on with it. And so we see it has a high correlated residual with RS7, RS8, RS9, RS10, RS11, RS12, RS13. So it's got all these correlated residuals. And that RS6 and RS8, that's a 79. That's, I think, the highest one we've seen so far. We keep scrolling down. Now I see a 24. I see a 37 with RS8 and RS10, a 24 with RS8 and RS11. 23 with RS10 and RS11. A 37 with Freedom Threat 1 and Freedom Threat 4. Ooh, an 83 with Freedom Threat 3 and Freedom Threat 4. That's the biggest one so far, right? 83. So that kind of makes you want to go back and look at these two items and say, why do these two items have something else in common? Uh, freedom Threat 3 and Freedom Threat 4. But you know what? Looking at these, even though that's the highest modification index, this 79 is really close, and we know there was a lot of problems in RS6 with the um, residual matrix, and so it kind of makes me want to say, let's do that one first. So let's do RS6 and RS8. So what I'm doing now is I'm saying, I want you to get a covariance between this item and this item. And it'll allow RS6 and RS8 to have a correlated residual. And that should improve my model fit by reducing the chi-square by 79. So if we make that modification, let's see how much. So one thing we'll see is if we get to the covariances, we're now estimating this covariance between the residual of RS6 and the residual of RS8. And it tells us, yeah, they are pretty highly correlated. Then if we look at our model fit, we see our CFI has gone up to 0.88 and our TLI has gone up to 0.87. Our RMSEA is down to 0.07 and our SRMR is still around 0.08. So the model fit's improving, it's getting closer, that one modification helped, but we're still not within the area of acceptability that most uh, researchers and statisticians would ask for. So we go back to the drawing board, and I bet you that freedom threat one that was 80 is still going to pop, yeah. So that is still there, uh, Freedom Threat 3 and Freedom Threat 4. And typically, we would want to look at the items again in the scale and say, does it make sense? And I bet if we look at those items in the scale again, it'll make a lot of sense. We also have that big one for Freedom Threat 1 and Freedom Threat 4. Now, the thing is, those items are supposed to be correlated, but they're supposed to be correlated because they're measuring the same variable. So that should be captured in the loading, um, and all of the relationships should be at the, at the latent space. And so the residual correlation suggests that there's something about those items that's not being captured that way. Let's see if we have any other really big ones that jump out to us. You know, we have these 25s, kind of 26s. We have some in the kind of 15 area. I just saw, you know, there's a 28, there's a 32. You know, so we have some bigger ones. Nothing that's really jumping out. Obviously, the freedom threat on anger and freedom threat on RS, but I say we do that FT3 and FT4 because that was the biggest modification in the model. And I'm sure if we looked at the items, it would make sense. 
Let's see how much that improves our model fit. So now we're at 0.89 and 0.88, or 0.90 and 0.89 for the robust CFI and the robust TLI. And our RMSEA is at 0 0.07 and our SRMR is at 0 0.08. So this is the level of model fit that the conventional uh, thresholds would say is okay. So it would say with these two modifications, we now have acceptable model fit. But the Hugh and Bentler recommendations that a lot of people have adopted as golden rules, we would still be well off. I mean, we're just at acceptability for the old thresholds. And this is what that Marsh quotation from video one in this uh, four part video series, this is what that Marsh quotation was talking about. That if you have, I mean, this is not big scales with a lot of items. This isn't 10 variables with 10 items each. Four variables, only one of them has a large number of items. And we've already had to make two modifications just to get it um, to the old thresholds. Now, if we inspect the modification indices, let's see if there's any other low hanging fruit. I mean, we've got, you know, this 23 here, and there are, um, you know, a 25 here. But as you can imagine, it's all going to be diminishing returns. If we start doing all these correlated residuals for all these, you know, this 26, we're going to have, we're going to have to make, you know, maybe 8, 10, 12 modifications before we can get our, um, before we can get a CFI and TLI at 0.95 and above. And so looking at all of these, you know, really the only low hanging fruit that's left is this, uh, you know, that cross loading is only 22 now. Um, where's the anger cross loading? Um, yeah, that, that anger cross loading has kind of gone away. Um, so, there aren't really a lot of obvious modifications left to make. So what do we make of that? What, is that? what does that tell us? Do we just say the Hugh and Bentler criteria are inappropriate? Or do we say, um, no, the Hugh and Bentler criteria are right and this model's misspecified? You know, the model might be misspecified. Um, what might be going on is that that state reactance scale has more dimensionality into it, and there's two sub-factors of, react of trait reactance. And where we were seeing all of those little modification indices popping up, you know, maybe what we really need to do is uh, run an exploratory factor analysis on trait reactance and see if there are two factors and uh, fit a second factor to get rid of all that little noise going on with those correlated residuals. Um, but we read those items and we don't want a two-factor trait reactance variable if there is a second factor in there it's not anything that's theoretically sensible based on what we're looking at it's probably well some of these items are worded a little bit in this you know getting at this component of the factor and some of these items are getting at this other component and they kind of hang with each other a little bit more and you end up seeing that a lot when you have large scales when you have you know 8, 10, 15 items. And so the most elegant solution when you have a problem like that is to create parcels where you average the items uh, to create uh, aggregate parcels of items. And so that's what the fourth video in the series is going to do. It's going to show you how to create parcels and it's going to show you the benefits you get when you create those parcels. So thanks for watching this video. I know it was a little bit longer, but hopefully it was very uh, informative in terms of how you might look at and think about modification indices. Um, and uh, the fourth video will hopefully be even more useful when it shows you how to use parceling to get good model fit um, when you feel fairly confident that your variables are good and that there's just a lot of low level noise that's dragging your model fit down.